Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Start from the motivation of the work, and basically the question we try to answer is how can we perform optimal high-dimensional hypothesis testing? And uh, so I will illustrate uh, using uh, the genetics application, especially testing for the uh, gene effect and also genetic network effect and against the sparse alternative. So I'll answer three questions. The first is whether we can use the verbal selection based penalized likelihood uh, estimator, for example, lasso, and uh, construct the sparse estimator and use that to construct the test. How would, would that perform? And second question is if we construct some kind of uh, higher criticism test and uh, whether the performance will be the same for linear regression and also for uh, binary regression like logistic regression. The third question is uh, if the genetics markers are correlated, in other words, if the design matrix uh, are correlated, and uh, whether um, the, we can improve the higher criticism test by accounting for the correlation among the markers. Then I'll illustrate that using uh, the GWAS data and also the discussion. So to start, um, the GWAS study mainly focused on the common variants, which genotype uh, millions of common genetic variants across the genome. So whole genome sequencing and uh, so that um, sequences the whole genome, and which consists about three billion base pairs across the genome. And the challenge for that whole genome sequencing study is 90% of the genetic variants across the genome are real variants, so only a very small number of people having it. And to show the difference between these two type of data, the, the left panel is the GWA study, which you can see basically that focus on the low size where the variants are sufficiently common. So we call the, uh, the minor allele that, uh, if, for example, if the probability of, so, oh, sorry, if the probability, say, the probability of G is greater than 5% in the population, that is called common variance. And so the difference between the GWAS study and the sequencing study is sequencing study basically get information every single base pairs. And so that also measures the real variance. So the real variance is missed in the GWAS, but is captured by the whole genome sequencing. For example, if you look at this, and yet among the 10 people, only one person has this variance, all the rest don't have. And so that makes the analysis much more challenging. So the data setup is we have uh, with genotype or sequence uh, tens of thousand subjects. And so the major interest is we want to study whether there is an effect of the gene, what genetic pathway, what genetic network. And so we generally consist a large number of genetic marker, like SNP markers. And we want to see whether there is association with the disease outcome or disease phenotype. And so the major challenge in this setting is um, that uh, the signals generally are weak and sparse. In particular, the problem we want to see is, suppose this is a, a chromosome. And within a chromosome, so there's one region the gene, and generally this, this is the genotype across different loci. So we want to see whether this gene is associated with that, um, obesity, for example. Well, we want to see whether this genetics network is uh, associated with the obesity. This is a disease phenotype. So, but the problem is among this genetics network, what among this gene, only a, a small number of genetics markers and, uh, are likely to be signaled. So, and also the signal are likely to be weak. And uh, so how can we develop a test which can test for this, the, the, the association between the gene or genetics network with the phenotype accounting for sparse and weak signal? And uh, so basically we want to test a large number of parameters against a sparse alternative. So to set this up, suppose the Y is a phenotype, what outcome? We have N subjects, and uh, then X are the covariates, like age, gender, and so on. And G indicates the genotype and, uh, of the P-SNP. Suppose if one um, gene has 1,000 SNPs, and then P will be 1,000. If a genetic network has uh, like 100 genes, each gene has like 20 SNP, and then basically at 2,000, um, uh, the P will be 2,000. And so the design matrix for G basically take value 0, 1, 2. So each column take value 0, 1, 2. 
And uh, so the betas are regression coefficients. So the uh, mu is the mean of the phenotype. For example, the case control status, conditional on the genotype and the covariance. So we set up like generalized linear model. So the edge will be a link function. And for linear regression, they should be identity link. And for logistic regression, they should be the logit link. And so we regress that on the covariance and also on the genotype. And uh, so of in a gene or uh, in, a, uh, in a genetics network. And so we want to see whether there is association between the gene and, uh, and or the genetics network with the phenotype. And uh, so basically we test the betas, which can be high dimensional, and uh, but still finite. Like can be uh, hundreds or can be, uh, can be dozens or can be thousands. And uh, then we want to see whether the beta equal to zero against the beta not equal to zero. So if the beta, the P demand, if P is like 2000, you can see this very, uh, it's a high dimensional test. And if we think about what are the challenges in this kind of high dimensional testing problem. And first, in the sequencing studies, the design matrix can be very sparse. And so the G matrix, and so basically for each column, and there are lots of lots of zeros, only a very small number, one or twos. And secondly, and the, the SNPs and can be correlated. We call the linkage disequilibrium, basically a statistician called the correlation. And so basically the SNPs are correlated and due to LD. And also the number of SNPs in a gene or network and may be large, and it can be dozens or thousands. And so also, and the alternative can take two situations, either the dense alternative or the sparse alternative. So what that means is under the alternative, whether there are lots of beta not equal to zero or a small number beta not equal to zero. And uh, so if I set this up, and uh, so basically what that means is, suppose the P is a number of markers on the in a gene or network. And, uh, and then K is the number of signals, so number beta is not equal to zero. So we assume the K is a function of the P as, as power, one minus alpha. And uh, so basically the null hypothesis, if we test the P beta equal to zero against the beta not equal to zero. So the difference between the dense and sparse alternative is basically lies in the alpha. So if alpha less than half, it doesn't mean 50% of beta not equal to zero. It means, suppose P equal to 100, if alpha is 0 0.6, that means 16 beta not equal to zero. The other 84 are zero. And for the sparse alternative, that uh, basically assume alpha greater than half. For the sparse regime, if like alpha equal to 0 0.4, then that means seven beta not equal to zero and the 94 um, beta equal to zero. So ideally, the Oracle test is supposed God tell me among those 100 betas, those seven not equal to zero, what I should do is I pick up those seven, throw away the 94, that will be most powerful test, right? But in reality, I don't know which seven not equal to zero. I even don't know how many not equal to zero. And uh, so that makes the test challenging. And uh, how, can we, uh, how can we do that? So, and it even makes things worse. And uh, there's no global optimal test. It doesn't exist. The test optimality depends on multiple things. It depends on the genotype matrix, the design matrix, how sparse it is, and also how much correlation among the markers, the LD structure. Also, it depends on the signal sparsity signals and depends on the, how sparse the signals are, how strong the signals are, and whether the beta are in the same direction or different direction. And furthermore, it turns out it also depends on the distribution of Y, whether it is a continuous distribution or binary distribution. And so, so basically, in order to construct the test, and, and without knowing which one are signals, so suppose like we start from the marginal statistics, and uh, so basically the correlation between the gene, each genetics marker and the Y. And uh, then uh, we assume the Z statistic after standardized it, it is normally distributed. So the question is if I have within this genetics network, I have a, a thousand Z statistic. So how can I optimally aggregate those 1,000 Z statistics to detect the association between the genetics network and the phenotype? And um, 
So oh, here are a few popular approaches which have been used uh, in the, the uh, statistical genetic literature. The first one is, uh, is non-threshold statistics. I have 1,000 of these statistics. I'm going to aggregate all of them and to aggregate all the ZG squares. And uh, so this intuitively, you, th you could, would think that this will have, have high power if the signals sparsity is low, and also the p-value can be calculated analytically. And, but it will have low power if the sparsity is high. Uh, this, uh, if the alternative is sparse, and one simple approach is to do the minimum p-value approach or the maximum z-statistic approach. And so intuitively, you would think this has a high power when the sparsity of the signal is high, and also will likely to have a lower power if the sparsity of the signal is low. And also, the p-value calculation is more difficult if the markers, the design matrix, is correlated. And uh, so, because we cannot use a order statistic calculation anymore. And uh, so, the higher criticism is another approach and to a test for the sparse, against the sparse alternative. So, the basic idea is, Suppose I have a thousand marker, I have thousand Z statistics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw away those Z statistics which are small. I'm going to keep those Z statistics which are large. Basically try to keep the signals. And then, so basically we count how many estimated signals are. I threshold Z statistic count how many significant markers are. And so this, you can see if the, the markers are independent. This basically follow a binomial distribution. And so if you threshold using 1.96, this may not be optimal. And so here, so basically if the, the design matrix is low coherence matrix, that means have low correlations, that means the co covariance of the, uh, the design matrix and uh, uh, will be independent or sparse, then the higher criticism test is um, based in the literature like Inkster and Donahoe and Jing and Arista and Carso and so on, basically you compare the number of significant tests minus its expectation divided by its variance. So you can see this variance assume the test statistics are independent. And so basically, graphically, so you basically want to do is try to find out what is optimal, oh sorry, what you do here, then you calculate the soup. You try to find out which T that maximizes the soup. And so basically that is like you find out the T and the threshold of the Z statistics that maximizes this uh, HC statistics. It is not 1.96. And so what are the existing results for linear regression? For the existing result, and so if the signals are dense, then if the signal is too weak and the node, all tests are powerless, if the signal is strong enough, then this kind of, of, of the scat, like some of these square men's ratio statistic will be powerful. If the signal is in the sparse regime, and if the signal is too weak, then all the tests will be powerless. If the signal is strong enough, then HC will be most powerful. So that means HC is, can reach the detection boundary if the signal is sparse. So here the assumptions are the design matrix has to be weak correlation, and also the A is the, uh, the signal strength of the beta. And so we assume the, the alpha basically measures the sparsity index. So the natural question to ask is, there has been quite a bit of literature on variable selections, and for example, like lasso. And so can we use the sparse estimator based on variable selection to construct the test statistics and how that will perform compared to HC, the higher criticism test. So intuitively, if you think we run lasso and select 10 variables, I can use those 10 variables to construct my test statistics. And so here basically the setup is, suppose we have a variable selection procedure using the penalized likelihood, and so the penalty is a concave penalty, and so lasso, SCAD, and MCP all belong to this class. Then I'm going to construct the several test statistics based on the beta hat, penalized likelihood estimator, either count how many non-zero beta hat estimated, or use the quadratic function of the survived non-zero beta hat, or use the penalized likelihood ratio statistic. So the question we ask is, can the test, based on consistent verbal selection procedure, have the correct type one error, like type one error rate is 0.05? 
Second, how small the signal can this uh, penalized likelihood-based approach detect? And uh, how that compared to the uh, detection boundary uh, that is optimal one and uh, specified uh, by the higher criticism? Turns out the result quite interesting. First, if we use a penalized likelihood-based approach to construct variable selection, consistent variable selection, asymptotically we cannot have alpha level test. Asymptotically the alpha will be zero. And uh, so and also the, um, if we use this variable selection based estimator to construct the test, and um, so it is um, um, it is read optimal for the sparse regime, but is suboptimal for the dense regime. So basically, the take home message is for linear regression with low coherent matrix, that means weak correlation among the columns of the design matrix, as long as the signal is strong enough, I'm going to be able to detect, to detect it. And so, a natural question is. Are these results still true if I have case control study? The phenotype is binary. And so intuitively, you would think that will still be true. Turns out the results is not the, is not the case. So for example, and, um, so if I have the GWA study, I'm going to have a common variance, and uh, so the design matrix will be dense. And uh, so if I have a sequencing study, and I'm going to have the real variance, and I'm going to have very sparse design matrix, and so to illustrate how sparse the design matrix is, so here is the earlier candidate gene sequencing study. It sequenced about 3,500 people, three candidate genes, totally about 96 variants. It turns out 50% of those 96 variants are singletons. So that means if you look at the design matrix, it's 3,000 by 100 matrix, and for each column, as there's only one once, all the rest are zeros. And 50% of those columns are like that. And uh, so the phenotype here is the binary hypertension or not. To show you the, how the genotype matrix looks like, and so this is for 500 rows, and uh, the black indicates the zeros, and the black dot indicates the one or twos. So you can see for this sequence, the genotype matrix, and for each column, you can see a lot of lots of black dots. So that means they are all zeros. Very small number of ones or two, those are black dots. Only this variance are common variance. All the rest are real variance. So that means the design matrix is very, very sparse. Each column, and a lot of lots of zeros, very small number of ones. And if we shuffle the columns, the design matrix will look like this. It's like a block diagonal matrix on the top, and the bottom is a contamination matrix. And uh, so what are the key results? It turns out the result for logistic regression are quite different from the result from linear regression. For linear regression, the detection only depends on how strong the signals are. It has nothing to do with the design matrix. But for the binary regression, turns out if the design matrix are too sparse, like the sequencing study, and if the design matrix is too sparse, no matter how strong the signal is, we are not able to detect it. So therefore, for the binary regression, instead of one point detection boundary, and uh, so it, it has two point detection boundary. And so the detection boundary will depend on not only the sparse, the signal sparsity and the signal strength also depends on how sparse the design matrix is. So if the design matrix is not too sparse, then the binary regression result using the, uh, the this um, uh, stat or the regular likelihood ratio test statistic or higher criticism will parallel the linear regression. And so the other issue I need to worry about in genetic study is when I work with the gene, and generally there's LD structure, so they are the, the genetic SNPs are correlated. So this is an LD map. So you can see that basically the dark indicates a correlation between two markers. So if it's very dark, for example, this, so this SNP and this SNP are highly correlated. So you can see basically if the, there is quite a bit of correlation among the genetic markers. So and, uh, Secondly, when I test for whether there is association between a gene and what genetic network with the phenotype, my p is finite. Even the p is not small, but the p is finite. And so I need to deal with the correlation because the higher criticism assume that the, the tests are independent to each other. But in genetic study, they are not. So how can we do, deal with the correlation? So 
So one idea is proposed by, uh, by uh, Peter Hao and Jia Sun Jin using this innovative higher criticism test. So the idea is basically we decorrelate the test statistics. So if the correlation of the Z statistic is sigma, let's decorrelate this using the uh, uh, single value decomposition and then transform it to Z star and then I'm going to decorrelate it. Then I'm going to apply the higher criticism test to the decorrelated statistics. And so this will work no matter what kind of correlation that have. And then we construct the higher criticism test and using the decorrelated statistic that they call innovative higher criticism. And uh, so it turns out that for the asymptotic to work in, to kick in, and uh, asymptotic need require very, very large P, very, very large markers. And uh, so the asymptotically, this statistic follows this gumbo distribution. And uh, so if the markers are independent, this innovative higher criticism and the higher criticism have the same distribution, and it converged to in this very, very slow rate, is log P rate. And so what that means is, in order for the asymptotic kick in, I basically need a very, very large number of markers. And so, if, so, so the solid line is a theoretical uh, distribution of the higher criticism. And uh, so this is an empirical distribution for p equal to 100 or p equal to 10.6. You can see even for p equal to 10.6, it's still quite far away from the theoretical uh, distribution. So, but in genetic study, the number of markers within a gene or within the network generally range from dozen to thousand. So that means asymptotic will never kick in. It is just too slow. And uh, so what that means is the type of error rate will be wrong if I use asymptotic result and apply it to scan the whole genome. And so what we need to do is to develop analytic exact p-value calculation for any given p. It turns out we can do that. So if we define a p-value for the higher criticism statistics, it turns out analytic p-value can be constructed for any given p and the, exactly. So that is nice. That makes things much easier. And it turns out, so here we compare the, the empirical p-value with the empirical type of error with the exact analytic p-value and asymptotic p-value. So for example, if you look at the uh, alpha level is 10 minus 2, if p equal to 10, you can see that if I use asymptotic p-value, it can be quite far off. If p equal to 50, it still can be quite far off, but analytic exact p-value is very accurate. So the other problem is I decorrelate the test statistic by transform the Z statistics. And, but the problem is when I decorrelate the test statistic, I'm going to mix the signals and uh, with the noise. I'm going to dampen the signals. That causes the uh, uh, innovative higher criticism lose the power. And so, for example, if you look at the, the GWA study for the breast cancer studies, and as the original skill, as the original test, and if I have a sparse signals as original test for each markers, and so you can see I have a few big Z statistics. When I decorrelated them, you can see the Z statistic become much smaller, and because I dampened the, I dampened the signal with the noise. So that's, that's why I motivated us to propose this generalized hierarchism idea. So I don't want to transform the Z statistics. I'm going to use original Z statistics. I'm going to allow the sigma to have any arbitrary correlations. And uh, so then in this situation, this S doesn't follow um, a binomial distribution anymore. It follows a beta binomial. So, I'm, so therefore, the denominator part, it needs to be the true variance of S. So that needs to account for the correlation among the marker. It turns out this covariance can be constructed. It's an over-dispersed binomial, so that can be constructed. So therefore, I'm able to construct the p-value analytically. And uh, so uh, for any given p, that is nice. So to illustrate, and so here, suppose I have a 40 markers. And uh, so suppose this correlation among the signal marker is 0.4. The uh, correlation among the noise marker is 0.4. And suppose two of them are causal variance. And this row two is a correlation between the signal and the noise markers. And so the, um, this green line is the innovative hierarchism. You can see the power is here. And uh, so the 
solid line is generalized hierarchism, you can see the power is much higher. Similar thing if I have a four signals. And uh, so, so we also apply this to the breast cancer GWA study. And uh, so you can then let's find out using the gener generalized hierarchism and this FGFR2 gene and reach the genome-wide significance. To summarize, on the statistical inference for high dimensional data is challenging. And the hypothesis testing based on consistent variable selection based penalized likelihood uh, test against a sparse alternative have similar property to higher criticism. And uh, then the property for signal detection depends on the distribution of the outcome. For linear regression depends on the signal sparsity and the strength. For binary regression also depends on the design matrix. So asymptotic p-value for higher criticism doesn't work well in practice and for finite p, but exact p-value is available. And the decorrelate test statistic is not a good idea. It loses the power. So generalized higher criticism account for correlation and also its power is robust. Yeah, thank you. Questions? So I have. Oh, go ahead. Um, when you talk about the uh, fact that you have possibly correlated the noise <coughs> and you uh, widen the data, <laughs> if the matrix U is not sparse, uh, even if you were, if, even, even if you had a sparse signal originally, now in the new variable, it's not sparse anymore. So that's why the power got diluted. So that's an innovative uh, higher criticism. And uh, so, the, so you denoise the, these statistics, and uh, so the size still right, just the power, you lose the power. Okay. Yeah. So that's why the, the idea is doing the, we, we use the generalized higher criticism, we don't denoise the okay. Z. And to, so to contain, to main the original skill. Yeah. Any so I have a quick one. Okay. So these, uh, Genotypes are measured with error, especially the uh, rare variants. It's, it's right now it's quite good, good as long as it's weak. I think if one, the, the, if the, the, if it's about 30x, it's or 50x, the sequencing error is very low. So you, in your model, you, you just, it needs to be treated as deterministic. Yeah, we should be deterministic. So it won't work for low coverage. Right, I think for low coverage, and uh, then the size is still right, and just a power issue. Yeah. Right, well, thank you. Yeah. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Mm -hmm.